everyone. Please let me know if you're having trouble hearing me or anything like that. Um, I want to begin first by saying thank you to Charlie and to Kelly, especially, and to everyone at the Institute for Historical Research. Um, it's really a it's really a great opportunity for me to get to present my work in, in this context. And I, I certainly want to thank all of you for coming and, and hearing me out. Um, the research that I'm going to talk about, some aspects of it have been published recently in Gastronomica, and I've talked about them in some other places. And it's to, to the extent that any of you are familiar with the article already, you're going to hear some things you've already heard, and then you're also going to hear some new things. This is, in some sense, a, a process piece of work and process. I'm, I'm finding out new things all the time and they're forcing me to rethink certain assumptions and conclusions and so forth. So <clears throat> that's what we're gonna be doing. And I find in general, when I present this, it's best to just begin by setting a scene. So I'm gonna do that here. Um, just imagine you're in a nondescript conference room, the sort of place where focus groups meet or market research is done or maybe undergraduate psychology experiments. Um, nondescript conference setting, tables, chairs, no windows, um, perhaps a mirror on the wall. The only thing that's unusual or remarkable about the setting in any way is that the lights are very low. Um, lab assistants or someone like that come out and serve you and the five or six other people that are in the room plates of food and utensils. The plates each have on them a steak, peas, and some form of roasted potato. And you're instructed to begin eating and note, you know, your impressions. And so that's what you do. And it all seems pretty normal until about halfway through the meal when suddenly the conventional lighting is restored. And you look down <clears throat> and suddenly realize that the steak you've been eating is blue, the peas are red, and the potatoes are green. And you or perhaps the other people in the room, of course, don't like this. You respond with agitation. Maybe someone becomes sick, angry, et cetera. Now, I'm guessing some of you, maybe more, have heard some version of this story or read this of some version of the story somewhere. And if you have, then you probably thought to yourself while I was telling it, hmm, this is uh, being embellished, that, that there are some new details in this version of the story. And that is true. But one of the things that I want to show you in this presentation is that I am not the first person to add details to this story. The other thing, probably the most important thing at all is that this story, despite having been cited in dozens of peer reviewed journals and major media outlets, in all likelihood never happened. Or at least it didn't happen in the place or the time it's been said to have happened. Um, and in all likelihood, it may not have occurred at all. So besides being, you know, worth examining just for that reason, I'm going to try to argue that the story is meaningful and it's proliferated for, for notable reasons. Um, here is, sorry, it's not letting me, there we go. Here are some of the dozens of journals that's appeared in uh, since 1978 or so. Um, the story has been cited by food scientists, by sensory scientists, by cognitive scientists, by ex experimental psychologists. And the studies that cited are almost always having something to do with the relationship between visual and gustatory perception, the relationship between sight and taste. Um, it's also appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, The Atlantic, um, National Public Radio and a number of other places. And in those places, it, it tends to be there to make similar sorts of points. Um, it's even been in the Virgin Airlines in-flight magazine. So I wanna talk about the origins of the story, but to do that, I first kind of wanna talk about the context in which I found it and ended up chasing it. Um, last fall, I was beginning a sabbatical with the intention of writing uh, sort of a survey text for a, for a food history class that I've been teaching since 2013. And I remembered this story. I remembered the story about these, you know, food scientists or flavor scientists or market researchers who sort of quasi poison their subjects by tricking them into ingesting, you know, strangely colored food. And it was salient to a point I was trying to make. So I went out to find the citation and it was, surprisingly difficult to do so. And I finally traced it to a magazine called Marketing. 
a trade magazine for advertising and marketing professionals published by Haymarket in London in the 1960s and 70s. Um, it, the source of an article called Putting Color into Marketing by an author named Jane Wheatley that appeared in this magazine in 1973. Um, it was hard to obtain a PDF of the magazine. Uh, the only copy that <laughs> The only copy that was even remotely accessible was in the British Library. And when I finally found it, I was very excited to read about the details of this experiment, even though I already thought it was kind of odd that it was in a, you know, essentially a, an advertising journal. Um, and when I read the article, as you can see, there is only kind of an oblique description written in the passive voice with very few citations. And it reads like this. And as you can see, it's, it's basically a stripped down version of the story that I just told you. So I thought that was strange. And I did what anybody would do in that situation, which is I started to track down the citations. And that's its own story. <clears throat> but I realized very quickly the story had spread in an unusual way with an unusual pattern. And this is a little bit of that. It was reprinted in 1975, whole cloth cut and paste in the Dragoco report, which is essentially a fragrance industry trade publication. Um, and then in 1977, the article, although not the anecdote, was cited in a research paper, a uh, conference paper rather, by, a, by a, um, a research physicist employed at Colworth. He, he worked for uh, Unilever. And then in 1978, you see the story appear for the first time. Um, in, a, in a peer reviewed journal in, the criti in critical reviews in food science and nutrition. And as you can see, it's basically the same story. Now, it goes quiet for a while and then reappears in the 1990s in the same journal. Uh, and the paper is by one of the co-authors of the 1978 paper. The only difference is that in the 1993 paper, Wheatley is now the experimenter. There is now a scientist or a, a market researcher named Wheatley, who is administering this study. And then in 1994, it appears in an edited volume, also broadly in the food science uh, family of, of disciplines. And this time it's an often cited experiment. And then the following year, another slight narrative adjustment takes place uh, in another food science article. But this time, this Wheatley person is the one actually serving the, the meal. Then in the 2000s, one moment, please. In the 2000s, you get something I think you could describe as a species jump in a way. Um, the story appears in the Atlantic, which I assume uh, most people are familiar with. It's sort of a, like a outlet of record for a certain strain of American liberalism. And it has been really since the 19th century. It started out as an abolitionist magazine in the 1850s. The author's name, who you might recognize is Eric Schlosser, the author of Fast Food Nation, which will come out the following year. Uh, this came out in 2000. Now the, the article, which is basically a profile of the flavor industry, um, would come out as a chapter in Fast Food Nation the following year, <clears throat> but with the reference to the experiment excised. Now you'll notice again, it's the same basic version of the story that existed in 1978. Now, I can't overstate the impact of the Atlantic in spreading the story. It's certainly the first place I read it. And I've just anecdotally, I've learned it was the first place that a lot of other people read it, at least in the United States. And it added a veneer of the sinister, I should say. Uh, the, emer the, the profile that emerges of the flavor industry in fast food nation is, is not a favorable profile. And that's gonna be a theme that returns later. Um, In the 2000s, among other things, the story appears for the first time in a doctoral dissertation, which I personally think implies a certain kind of respectability. I mean, I, if you've written a PhD, you know that you're pretty conservative about what sources you cite. So I do think that speaks to a kind of degree of acceptability that it hadn't had before. In 2004, it appears for the first time outside of the milieu of food uh, science and sensory studies. Um, in a journal, in an article called Neuro, Neuroimaging of Multisensory Processing. And again, another slight narrative embellishment, the participants initially enjoyed eating the meal. 
And then in 2005, back in Appetite, a kind of multidisciplinary food studies journal, it's referred to for the first time as a classic study. In the 2010s, it appears in a textbook for the first time, a nutritional psychology textbook. And I do think this is significant because most undergraduates who would take a nutritional psychology course in the United States would be going off to work in allied health fields, dealing directly with um, clients, patients, and so forth. In 2012, a new trend emerges. For starters, as you can see, Wheatley now becomes a he. Um, which is not something that you'd seen before. In 2015, the more colorful elements start to appear. Uh, a mischievous marketer invites a group of friends to their home, presumably, and serves them blue steaks and hides the steaks with lighting. And then in 2015, it's now a dinner party. And the study is now a classic study. In a marketing textbook from 2015 called Brand Meaning, uh, this is subtle, but for accounting, in recounting the story, the author writes experiments have shown meaning that this is something that's happened multiple times or something. And then in 2018, most recently, um, the study is a famous study and I personally find this interesting. It's begun to add furniture. There's now a, a dinner table. And then during this period, the same story starts to appear again in more rapid succession in larger, more mainstream media, the places we talked about already, The Guardian, The Salt. Um, one moment. The Guardian, NPR, um, a website called The Kitchen, <clears throat> which is owned by something called Apartment Therapy. And this is sort of just a collage of lifestyle websites that are trafficked by millions of people. The New York Times Magazine and a story about blue M&Ms and in NPR Science Friday. Now, <clears throat> one of the same authors who made a number of the more colorful references to the, uh, to the experiment on the academic articles I just cited comes up a lot in these articles as a cited source. And the quote here is very interesting. This is from the Guardian article, because you'll notice for the first time the story of the blue stakes and Wheatley and so forth isn't being presented as, um, it isn't being presented as a story. It's now just being presented as, you know, a series of causal relationships with a predictable outcome. Um, so this brings us to 2017, 2018. And I should point out that the story, I think I had this naive idea that after I published the Gastronomica article, the, the story would, people would stop citing it, but that hasn't been the case. And while I was preparing this presentation, I actually read a pretty interesting article um, that cited it about uh, food color and uh, spectrum disorders and anxiety. It was fascinating, but there again, the Wheatley story was in there, the story of someone tricking people into eating blue food cited as it generally is, as evidence of the importance of color and gustation. So now we've gotten through the academic citation follies uh, portion of the, of the presentation. And now I wanna dig a little deeper into where it came from. Um, I think, I, I think I've shown so far that the story is commonly invoked, didn't happen, at least not in that way. And I think there are plenty of additional reasons to be skeptical that certain aspects of the story um, are impractical and unlikely. But having said all that, a lot of stuff clearly did happen in a lot of different places. And uh, I still don't believe I've gotten to the bottom of it. But let's begin with the Wheatley article itself. It cites one source directly and one source indirectly. Um, neither of which contain reference to anything like a food color experiment involving food coloration or lighting or anything like that. The first is a paper by Boris Townsend, who I understand is a foundational figure in implementing color television in the United Kingdom in the 1960s. Um, this was an occasional paper he gave for the BBC and he devotes the first part of it to the physiology and neurology of vision. The second part to various engineering problems associated with color television and the third to the, what he calls the psychology of color, uh, which is where for our purposes, things get interesting. Colors, according to Townsend, have fixed meanings and color preferences can pay, convey specific psychological facts about individuals. An individual who tends to adjust the colors on their TV toward uh, cyan, according to Townsend, is quote, inwardly weak and shy. Someone who adjusts the color casting on the TV towards blue, on the other hand, is content and tends to overeat. Now, Townsend in turn cites a Swiss psychotherapist named Max Luscher. He was a Jungian by training, 
and the author of something called the Lusher Color Test, which was meant to determine facts about people's personalities by giving them colored um, index cards and asking them to arrange them in order of preference. And I've actually brought it here to show you because it's fascinating. This was, uh, as far as I can tell, a very popular book for a brief period in the 1970s. Um, it came with detailed instructions for how to administer this test and also the cards themselves, which are colors on one side and numbers on the other. And the Lusher color test went something like this. You gave the person you were administering your test uh, all the cards and ask them to arrange them in order of preference. You make note of the order they use, then you shuffle the cards, give them back and have them do it again. Um, and then they do it again, presumably differently. And you keep track of that. And then somehow by adding up the numbers, this tells you something about the person's personality. Um, it's kind of, it's eccentric, you know, when I describe it like that, but it's also interesting to think how popular and how widely accepted this sort of color research was um, in certain circles in the 1970s. So Lusher's referenced indirectly by Wheatley. Um, and what the what Lusher and Townsend seem to be having had seemed to have in common that seems to have had some influence upon the original article putting color into marketing is a set of uh, assumptions about color preference that are based on deductive rather than inductive reasoning and in the tradition of Jungian and Freudian psychology. Um, but before we get to any more of that, you're probably wondering why we're looking at this picture of this uh, man from the 1960s wearing a suit. His name is Clive Rumsey, and he's thanked in the article. And there's one particular chart of his uh, that is reproduced in the article as well. Rumsey was a prominent figure, as far as I can tell, in the advertising industry in both London and New York in the 1960s. He was at Lintus, which was Unilever's in-house advertising uh, company for a significant period of time. And in the industry during this period, he was sort of an advocate for color research. He was out there making the case in a variety of forums that advertising and marketing professionals should pay attention to color. Um, there's also a document he authored that is in the um, Unilever archives in Port Sunlight that I was very excited to go and look at in May, was unable to for obvious reasons, but the survey's titled Color, a survey of experimental evidence and implication for marketing and advertising. And I sense there may be some version of the Wheatley story in there. Um, he, whatever connection he has to this remains out of touch for the time being. But based on all the sorts of proclivities that come out of these three sources, it's helpful to look at other things that were happening in the 1960s as well. There was a thing in the 1950s and 60s with people dyeing food odd colors, ostentatiously odd colors. And we know this honestly through anecdote, mostly biographical anecdote about celebrities. And I've got three such examples of this on the board here. So the person, the first person, uh, some of you may recognize is Shirley Jackson, the, the Gothic horror novelist. Um, whose works are now being made into television shows and, and rediscovered. Uh, a biographer of Jackson describes her domestic life in Bennington, Vermont in the 19, I believe the 1950s in some detail. And uh, she was known for eccentric behaviors, one of which was serving dinner party guests, uh, many of whom were uh, pretty prominent writers like Ralph Ellison, steaks that had been dyed blue. And then of course that's Alfred Hitchcock in the middle. Hitchcock. Um, bragged repeatedly to various uh, biographers and journalists later in his career because he was, he was a, he was a um, impassioned self-promoter. Hitchcock bragged about having <clears throat> hosted a dinner party at the Trocadero in the 1960s where he served guests a menu of food, uh, all of which was dyed blue. And then many of you probably recognize Fanny Craddock, the celebrity uh, TV chef in the UK, uh, I believe from the 1950s through the 1970s. She had a penchant for food dyes. Uh, she particularly liked dyeing potatoes green. And um, there are several reasons for this. And there's some interesting books to read about this. <clears throat> in the 1950s and 1960s, magazines like Good Housekeeping brought color images, particularly those related to food uh, pretty much everywhere. And as the cultural historian Carol Ann Marling pointed out quite some time ago, 
the more garish these images were, the more they stood out. And the more convenient cooking and kitchen products became, the more magazines like Good Housekeeping or Betty Proper's picture book, All Color, uh, suggested recipes to their readers that were ornate and technically complex, particularly with regard to colors, which had to be you know, induced artificially. Color television, uh, is, color television is an important, becomes an important part of people's lives around this time too. And color television had a fraught relationship with food according to the historian, Susan Bright, because if the colors were off on a particular TV set, which they often were in the 1960s, foods could look extremely unappetizing. And uh, this was a major concern for advertisers. And it does give you some context as to why people like Clive Rumsey were beating the drum for color and color research in the advertising industry in the 1960s. And then of course, there's the pro proliferation of colored food dyes. There were plenty of safe charcoal based dyes available after the second world war to both manufacturers and consumers but tainted food scandals from an earlier era where toxic dyes were used to make the inedible look edible were within living memory for a lot of people. And regulators in both the US and the UK were forever banning food dyes and then reinstating them. You might ask yourself why Shirley Jackson was dyeing uh, food blue, dyeing steaks blue, uh, but you also might ask yourself why there was a tube, you might ask yourself why there was a tube of blue dye ready at hand in the kitchen. Um, and that's because food dyes were probably more popular than they'd ever been before or have been since in the 1960s. So what I'm trying to describe for you here is a generation of consumers who are growing up in a color saturated world that offered cheaper and more plentiful food than their parents had known. Dyeing a food item a counterintuitive color clearly meant something, something we can only get fragments of, but we can see traces of whatever that meaning was in the 1973 marketing article. So now let's go further back as we look for the origins of this story of people dying steaks blue in oddly lit rooms. And we inevitably find our way back to World War II and Cold War food acceptance research. Um, and the historian Nadia Berenstein has done great work on this showing in great detail the extent, the extent to which modern multi-sensory food preference research emerged from military research into what was then called food acceptability conducted in the 1940s. The problem was that armies had to meet the caloric needs of soldiers on the move. And the best way to do this was with foods that were dehydrated and calorically dense. Um, the problem though, was that these foods were unappetizing and unpopular with soldiers. And so research scientists were charged with finding ways to increase their appeal. This required them to examine the non gustatory responses to food and drink, i.e. taste, touch, smell, hearing, and much of this research took place in the Chicago headquarters of the Army Quartermasters Institute, which was sort of like the logistics branch, still is the logistics branch of the US military. Uh, w. Franklin Dove, a biologist, who's mostly remembered now for using surgical procedures to, um, to uh, surgical procedures on horses to create quote unquote uniform, uh, unicorns. Uh, he was a prominent figure in the Quartermaster Institute during this period. And he devised what will become for a long time, a first principle of sensory studies, which is that by isolating individual sensory responses, you can to some extent <coughs> control for the problematically subjective human taster from whom you're trying to get information about what consumers or soldiers will or won't find acceptable to eat. So Dove developed what you might call a culinary isolation booth basically a library carol where the subject could eat while every aspect of their environment was controlled from temperature to ambient noise to lighting. Now this technique and others in a familiar, pat in a familiar pattern made their way into the private sector from the military in the 1950s. And this public to private flow of technology happened somewhat slower in the UK than it did in the US, which is lucky for us because it means that we get to watch this newsreel footage from the 1950s detailing these exact sorts of technologies in action in the research department of the Ministry for Agriculture, Fisheries and Food. Uh, and by the way, this was, um, it was the historian Sally Horrocks uh, at Leicester who directed me to this and I'm forever grateful to her for doing that. Let's see, I apologize if there's a commercial that plays first. For those who can't stand heights, let's settle your stomachs with a visit to a place where they seem to make it their speciality. 
Here, the latest advances in dehydrated foods, for example, are prepared and analyzed to such a fine degree that one wonders what these food boffins will have in store for us next. Although as long as it's appetizing, we don't really mind. The location is the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food Experimental Kitchens, where we're watching just one aspect of research, the preparation of different foods in their various forms, from fresh to dehydrated, for the expert tasting panel. The principle of dehydration is not new, of course, dating back to a thousand years BC. But the recent advances, described as a major breakthrough in technique, are regarded as being as important in their way as the advent of jet propulsion in aviation. Ingenious and practical in every situation, it takes only the addition of cold water to provide freshly cooked food without loss of taste. Hence, the tasting panel. The use of the colored filters, you'll have noticed, is to prevent the eye being influenced by natural color appeal, although as smell as well as sight and taste plays its part in defining a flavor, the nose should really be blocked up too. Still, perhaps that's going a bit too far. Needless to say, work on a tasting panel has its drawbacks too. At the end of a day of color influence, the toughest stomach can rebel. From so, you can see the logic there. The, the subject is being given some uh, rehydrated meat product of some kind to eat, and the lighting gels above them are changed out to determine whether particular colors make the food uh, more or less appetizing. And while the efficacy might be questionable, you 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 can see you you can see a vague connection. You can see a vague thematic connection. For those and who can't for some stay at that settle your stuff. I do apologize. I have to figure out how to get to the next screen. There we go. So right there in Chicago, the same city as the Quarter Inst Quartermaster Institute's research headquarters was a private firm uh, during the same period called the Color Research Institute of America. And it was headed by a psychologist named Louis Cheskin. Cheskin was an early pioneer of consumer research and he later became famous for helping to create the core visual iconography of McDonald's from the signature arches in the logo to the orange and the red color scheme. Now, in 1947, a journalist named Lucia Perigo wrote a profile of Cheskin and his organization for the Central Press Association, which, is a, which was a regional wire service. And there it is. <clears throat> Proof positive that color plays an important part in the enjoyment of food was demonstrated recently at a dinner party given by an illuminating engineer. At the dinner table, the guests take their seats, the finest of dishes, definitely a gourmet's binge. Suddenly the lighting switched from white to colored bulbs, the steaks turn gray, the celery pink, the salad violet, the peas black as caviar, the milk red, the eggs blue. You get the idea. It's um, a larger menu. The colors are slightly different, but, um, and of course the host is a lighting engineer rather than a marketing researcher, but this takes us back to 1947. Now it seems overwhelmingly likely to me that this is the source of the story in, the, in 1973. But what's the source of this version of the story? Uh, did Cheskin tell it to the journalist? Did the journalist hear it somewhere else? Did someone tell it to Cheskin? Did it happen down the street in the Army Research Facility at the Quartermaster's Institute? Did uh, perhaps a lighting engineer in the 1940s actually play a cruel cool trick on some unsuspecting dinner guests? I suspect the story is apocryphal. And here's why. Cheskin was part of an emerging group of color prophets color uh, experts in the 1940s who spoke compellingly to business and industry in a language that was part Freud, part design principles, and part, for want of a better word, magic. So here, are, here is a, a very non-exhaustive list of prominent color consultants who more or less meet this category. Faber Buren, Louis Cheskin, Howard Ketchum. Um, the original arguably was Faber Buren. Born in 1900, he studied color theory at University of Chicago under Walter Sargent and began writing books on color in the 1920s. By the 1930s, he'd moved decisively toward a career as a corporate consultant in which he experienced massive success until his death in the 1980s. Although conversant with optics and writing in a rationalist tradition of color theory that dates back to the French chemist, uh, Michel Chevroux, 
Buren generally presented to his corporate clients in the textile and food and beverage industries in, in expansive and lyrical terms. And I'll show you an example of that in a moment. Howard Ketchum, on the other hand, was an engineer who'd worked on camouflage designs for the army during the Second World War. He then went to ad agencies and then DuPont Chemicals before becoming an independent consultant with a global client list. He wrote in Harper's Bazaar in 1936 that dinner party hosts should illuminate their homes with magenta lights because, quote, the soft illuminating glow makes the guests look 10 years younger. So there you go. Uh, you've got an illumination engine, a self-described illumination engineer who throws dinner parties and experiments the lighting. So this may very well be our culprit. Um, and then, of course, there's Lewis Cheskin again. And while Biren, Ketchum, Cheskin, and for that matter, Max Lucher and others, and many other people I haven't named, um, all agreed on the fact that colors have fixed meanings, that they correspond in some sense to human attributes. Um, they disagreed, however, upon whether these meanings were universal, applying more or less in the same way at all times to all humans, or whether they were bound by geography, gender, class, and any number of other things. So that is the color consultants. Now, I want to talk about another world of color research that emerged from the Second World War. We've already talked quite a bit about food science, psychophysics, which is what uh, sensory studies was called at one point. Uh, and these are interdisciplinary fields that sought, among other things, to reliably quantify human food preferences. <clears throat> We've discussed its origins in World War II military research and its subsequent growth in the post-war university system. Um, I'd just like to bring it back around real quickly and add that this is a, a really interesting chapter in the development of sensory studies happened at U the University of California, Davis in the 1950s under the direction of Rosemary Pangborn and a guy named Maynard Amarine. And the historian Stephen Shapin has shown that sensory studies at Davis grew in tandem with the California wine industry and that much of the established language of wine appreciation now comes directly from courses taught and research conducted at Davis during this period. But the reason that I really wanna remind you briefly about sensory studies is this. So while it seems that the tale of the blue stakes originated in functional color, the world of the color consultants, I believe it was perpetuated in the world of sensory studies. And I believe this is because the two were for a long period locked in direct competition for the attention of the food and beverage industry. This is an issue of food technology, which was the official organ of the Institute for Food Technology which was a meeting place for business and industry, government, and uh, the academy to talk about issues specifically related to food mass production. This is a 1963 issue that was devoted specifically to problems of food coloration. And it led off with back-to-back -back articles by two people we've heard about already, who we've talked about already. Frederick J. Frederick J. Francis, who was part of the food technology department at UMass Amherst. Which, interest, uh, which interestingly is one of the first uh, places to do the sort of research that was conducted uh, by the army in the academy. Um, and it's also part of the crowd of people that was the first to cite the Wheatley story as an academic source um, in an academic journal. So Frederick J. Francis on one hand, and then on the other hand, you have Faber Beeren. So Francis's article is a primer on a technology he called food colorimetry, which was the measurement of the coloration of food and the statistical methods required to make reliable predictions and assessments of food color in large quantities, mostly of agricultural products. There's a lot of talk about how to measure the redness of tomatoes, for example. It's worth noting here that Francis is one of the few food scientists of the era who focused less on measuring the perception of color and more on measurement, or more on measurement of the objects themselves. From what I've been able to find so far, food colorimetry never quite successfully launched and was low, largely overtaken by psychological studies of color perception within the field. Now, Biren's article, as you're probably expecting, is very different. It begins with a series of lyrical sentences about the importance of color to humanity generally before setting to its main work, which is telling the reader which colors are inherently palatable, like orangish, orangish yellow, uh, versus which ones are inherently unpalatable, like yellowish green. And there are, as you would expect, no references. Um, my point here is that we have schools, for want of a better term, of color analysis that on one hand are methodologically incompatible, but on the other hand have a mutual interest in making the case for the importance of color for the food and beverage industry. Both claim to have, quote, solved for color in some sense. And they are, I'm increasingly 
or they were, I'm increasingly certain, in direct competition for resources. So how did that competition play out over decades and what did it look like? Well, I would say it kind of looked like this, Crystal Pepsi. Crystal Pepsi debuted worldwide in the early 90s amidst a multi-million dollar marketing campaign. It performed dramatically below expectations and was pulled from the shelves a few years, in a, after a few years. In marketing literature, it's now famously derided as a failure of market research. Although there's also a revisionist interpretation out now that blames Coca-Cola for deliberately sabotaging Crystal Pepsi with the introduction of Clear Tab. I'm in no position to comment authoritatively on that, but this was part of a larger trend known as the Clear Craze. And I've heard a compelling argument that the Clear Craze was based on the popularity of a single non-falsifiable premise that was extremely popular within the advertising industry in the late 80s and early 90s. And that premise was clarity equals purity. In other words, that clearness, transparency, the absence of color, et cetera, is equated in the minds of consumers with purity, with the absence of corruption. In other words, the argument went, consumers in the 1980s and 90s were fed up with artificiality, with the synthetic, with the false, and they wanted to return to, uh, and they wanted a return to simplicity, e.g. purity. Now, this reasoning should sound familiar. It's the self-contained, self-referential theoretical framework of an earlier generation of color consultants. It's simple, powerful, and based on untested assumptions about how human beings in some sense are. In the case of Crystal Pepsi, it appears to have been disastrously wrong. But then again, you could argue that consumers weren't the intended target of the clarity equals purity argument. The intended target was the leadership of PepsiCo's product development team who had to be convinced that this was a reliable, um, this was a reliable source of direction for their product development. So according to one person from the other side of the aisle that I've spoken to about this, I, an experimental psychologist who did a lot of work on the way color impacts the perception of smell, absolutely no one in the world of food science or sensory studies was surprised by the Crystal Pepsi debacle. And this is because one of the most important ideas to come out of sensory studies since the 1960s is that people respond badly to disconfirmed expectations. In other words, your non-taste senses, particularly vision, give cues about how something's supposed to taste. If what your eyes have told you something is going to taste like does not correspond to the actual taste, you will react with some degree of revulsion. And yet, sensory scientists seemed unable to influence the outcome in this case. The clear is pure argument was for whatever reason, more persuasive to the advertising industry, more persuasive to the food and beverage industry. So at the risk of confusing causation and correlation, this is where I'd like to point out that the early nineties is when the blue steak story began to appear regularly in food science journals. So the story seems to have originated with the color consultants on one hand, nearly half a century earlier, but the story of the blue steaks found a home in food science and sensory studies journals where it made a case for both the importance of color and the importance of uh, studies, uh, systematic studies of color perception. And in the last decade uh, or so, as sensory studies has broadened into a more complex multi-sensory or cross-modal types of inquiry and simultaneously also become more public facing and more media savvy, the blue stakes have become a more important part of the narrative. The story has begun to appear more frequently. So we do have an existing literature to build on when asking questions about falsehoods that circumvent the peer review process. In 2014, a Norwegian anthropologist published a fascinating study of a two-tiered food-related myth that had proliferated in academic settings for nearly a century. Um, <clears throat> and when I say two-tiered, I mean this. You've of course heard that spinach contains unusually high amounts of iron. This is not true. You may have very well have known that that's not true. But you may have also heard that this inaccuracy has been perpetuated because of an errant decimal point in the scientific study from the 1930s. This, it turns out, is also not true. As with the blue stake study, a researcher invoked the story with a questionable citation, and that made it through the peer review process. From there, because it had a certain type of utility for a certain type of argument, it proliferated. Now, for Rechtal, the, the anthropologist, there are two possible culprits for the spinach myth. Uh, on one hand, he cites research and citation shortcuts that have been made possible by the digital revolution that we've all lived through. Um, 
And then on the other hand, there's also publication pressures that lead to questionable research. He seems to come down on the latter, but I think for the blue stakes story, both have merit. And yet I think if the question is simply, why did this happen? We can even go a little further, uh, specifically to the work of folklorists who study urban legends. And I'm thinking in particular of Veronique Campion Vincent, who wrote a book in 2005 called Oregon Theft Legends. And in the, in the book, she found this, that stories of kidnapped children and tourists waking up in bathtubs full of ice proliferated wherever specific bodily anxieties were prevalent. Um, so with that in mind, I, and this is where we're closing out, let's take a look at two of the popular appearances of the blue steak story from the last decade. This is from The Salt, NPR's national NPR is a food show, essentially one of its food shows. This piece from 2014 profiled a photography exhibit by an artist named Laurie Brown, specifically their colored food series. That was the name of the series in which uh, they photographed conventional foods with color combinations deemed unsettling, including the blue chicken, which you can see here. Um, and here is a quote that explains the, oh shoot, let me find this. Yeah, here's a quote that explains the inspiration for the work. Brown says the project came when started hearing about food additives. The more she learned, the more fascinated, repulsed she grew. It got to the point where I didn't think I could make a good purchase at the grocery store, she says. Now here's another one. This is from the aforementioned website, The Kitchen. Color plays a huge role in how we decide what to eat and marketers know it. In fact, package designers know more about color significance. Um, the kitchen article is even more explicit. The food, pro food producers, packagers, marketers are using color to trick you, according to the article, into buying things that are bad for you or things that you don't need. And the blue steak story is proof of their malevolence. Arm yourself with knowledge, the story goes to fight this malevolence. Now, I believe this version of the story is the future of the blue steaks story. Um, and I believe it was set in motion in 2000 by Eric Schlosser in his Atlantic article. And although the story was excised before the publication of Fast Food Nation, it seems to have survived and become evidence of the vagaries of the flavor industry. Yet paradoxically, it's also been perpetuated by sensory researchers who wish to influence that industry and make it more effective in its commercial aims. Thank you. Um, there's, I should just say very quickly, um, when I present this work, people tend to tell me things that ends up being really interesting and really useful. So if you are one of those people, if this made you think of something you heard about um, related to blue food or blue steaks or, or any, anything about this sort of vagaries of food research, please contact me. I, I would really appreciate that. Thank you.